Lee, I want to thank you for those very, very kind words. But more importantly, uh, I want to thank you for your leadership that you've shown uh, if to the labor movement and to this coalition and for your friendship over the years. Uh, there's been no better, and I want to say thank you in front of all these people for both of those. <clears throat> Let me say good morning to all of you. Now, on behalf of the 56 unions and the 10 million working men and women of the AFL-CIO and the 2 million plus associate members of Working America, I want to welcome all of you to Washington, D.C. for the Good Jobs, Green Jobs Conference. And I have to tell you that I'm truly honored to be part of this opening plenary with Marjorie Alt, uh, the Executive Director of Environment America and my friend Terry O'Sullivan, uh, the president of the laborers' union. Let me start <clears throat> by saying this. You know, what a year it's been, right? Now, who would have dreamed uh, a year ago that we'd be here today with a new government and our first African-American president, Barack Obama? <laughs> now, i got to tell you, November's election, I think, changed history. It's forced us to face up to and to struggle with issues of race and class. And I believe it's helped our nation turn a corner, and there's no going back now. And being here today, for all of you and all of us, is all about moving ahead. I want to thank the Blue-Green Alliance and all the trade union, environmental, business, and community partners responsible for this necessary and absolutely wonderful event. This has been a, a very good week here in Washington, D.C. It's a good week to talk about good jobs and green jobs because it comes at a time when good ideas and loud voices are desperately, desperately needed. And yesterday, Congress saw a multicultural, multiracial labor and environmental army that was a voice for workers, a voice for good jobs, and a voice for a cleaner planet. Now, I got to tell you, for some, I'm sure it was very, very disconcerting to see the Sierra Club with their pro-worker, pro-union, pro-employee, free choice posters. And for others, well, they were probably shocked to see union members and environmental, environmentalists walking the halls of Congress together, thinking alike, talking alike, supporting one another. I'm sure they were shocked. And here's what I have to say to both of them. Get over it, because you're going to see us there a lot together, right? Now, as Marjorie said to you, there's no secret that there's still some issues that d we differ on. But we also recognize that we're bound together by a much greater, a much more important, a much more compelling ideal. As I've heard my union brother, my good friend Leo Girard say so many times, we reject the notion that we have to choose between good jobs and a clean environment. It's not one or the other, it's both or neither. So your presence on the Hill spoke to that idea. It was such a contrast to all the suits that were wandering around the, the marble halls from the National Association of Manufacturing. Because it, whether you knew it or not, and not many people really recognized, it was their big lobbying day too. But did they come to lobby for green jobs or a cleaner planet? Nah, they didn't care about that. They came to say no to the Employee Free Choice Act. They came to say no to regulation. They came to say no to a new trade policy. And they were silent, deafening silent on Buy America. Now, here's an association whose members that lost over 500,000 jobs last year. They've lost 4.4 million jobs since 2000, and they've had 40,000 of their manu manufacturing plants close their doors. Now, you might think that the NAM would 
want to change its tune, right? They should be here. They should be working with us to drive a good jobs, green jobs policy for America. But they were silent. And their silence is really a metaphor for the challenge that lies before all of us. You see, the AFL-CIO recognized this challenge in our 2008 Greening the Economy statement that ended with the following words. We said, the nation stands at the crossroads of opportunity for domestic investments in innovation, new technology, and energy efficiency that will save jobs, create new jobs and new industries, and revitalize American manufacturing. We said there's no guarantee that these will be good jobs or that the investments will be made here unless we fight to make it so. Now, when the AFL-CIO declared that, we knew that our nation had to take bold, bold steps to meet the 21st century challenges related to climate change and that the world is looking to our nation for leadership. We knew we faced a climate change crisis that the United Kingdom Stern Commission said represented the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. We also knew that our nation was on the verge of an economic meltdown with inequality soaring, tens of millions without health care, secure retirement becoming a luxury of the rich, and where good middle class jobs, investment, and innovation have been our leading exports. And now, well now the crash has happened and we face dual market failures, climate change and the greatest economic crisis of our lifetime. Now the American labor movement believes that we must have a strategy, a strategic approach to greening the economy centered on domestic investment in new technologies, in the creation of good jobs, and in leading a shared international response to both of those issues. Now, there are a lot of voices who will scream that given the scale of the economic crisis, America can't afford to deal with climate change, or to buy America, or to renew the fundamental compact between the federal government and the American worker. Now that compact, you recall, is based on the simple understanding that government has a responsibility to act as a countervailing power on behalf of workers and our families, and the belief that shared prosperity is fundamental to any democratic society. Now, the naysayers are the same financial and industrial interests that advise the entire world economy into chaos. And their advice to us is, quite frankly, much more of the same. No rules, no regulation, unfettered free markets and unfettered free trade. Well, what they don't get is that the American people have had enough of their brand of economy. <laughs> what they don't get is while we may have born, been born at night, it wasn't last night, and that we know it's time for real change. And what Barack Obama and the new Congress is faced with goes way, way, way beyond making a few little fixes around the margin. 